my mother had such an enormous influence on, on my shaping my voice. Um, she was a brilliant storyteller and she, she loved language and her vocabulary was, was very wide, very deep, very wide. She, she had an interesting, her, the story of her life is interesting because she had two African grandmothers and two uh, European grandfathers, so right. an Englishman and an Irishman and two women of African descent, which is where, you know, were her grandparents. And, and they all grew up in the same air place. So she grew up hearing all of this in English and the Gaelic and the, the, the Africanness, and it, it all came together, which is very Jamaican. So I, I, I loved her stories and I love listening to her and I love her speech. And so that, I think that formed the, the, the foundations of my own writing and the way my, my, my poetic voice and my writer's voice is very much influenced by my mother. So um, she was a very big hearted, very generous person. And one of the, her concerns in life, she, she, her capacity to care for huge numbers of people was, was astonishing. She had nine children, but she always felt like, oh, I have nine, I can look after 15 just as easily. So we always had more people in our house than, you know. But more than that, the sort of ways in which she would look out for other women, women in, in you know, women in danger, women, you know, in situa abusive situations. I, she would actively try to help, you know, find ways to help them cope and out of that. And, and a lot of that has come back into my work. I see that as something you can do. Because sometimes a word can be a powerful thing. A word or said at the right time, in, in the right season, can help to change somebody's life. Mm -hmm. that's true. And so I, I, I like to think that some, that's what I'm trying to do. It's kind of like writing some of what I saw my mother doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any that sense. That makes perfect sense. What role do politics play in your writing? Oh, a big role. I mean, obviously, if you read my work, you know that. Mm -hmm. I have very strong um, opinions about love and justice, really. Um, a friend of mine says that all my work can be divided into two. It's there are you know, writings about love or, or justice, and more, more often than not, about love and justice. That's true. <clears throat> In the essays, that definitely comes out. There's a lot of love, but there's a lot of hunger and thirst for justice and yeah. what also what it means. It explores it as well. Yeah. Right. Okay. You recently received the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry. So mm -hmm. first of all, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, and you're obviously aware of this. You are the first black woman to receive this since it was first awarded in 1933. Right? <laughs> so I wanted to ask how you feel about that personally of being the first black woman who, to receive this. Um, Oh, I think we, one of the things I've done as Poet Laureate of Jamaica is that I've started a, series, a set of prizes. I was very happy to do that because I know prizes are important to, to writers and to artists, especially poetry, which doesn't really pay a lot, or, you know. But I was, I, because I, I've been very fortunate the past couple of years, to, I won the Wyndham Campbell, Campbell Awards of Poetry, which gave you some, some money. And so I used some of that prize money that I won, and I started some prizes for young people in Jamaica. So this will be the third year, and um, you know they, they get a thousand US dollars, and um, I have four four prizes we give out, and um, it's been ter it's, it's it's just lovely to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really so much thinking about hey, you know, am I getting a prize as a black woman? I'm thinking how can I pass on, you know, how can I pay this forward? How can I give prizes to young people who wouldn't normally be getting any? Yeah. How did you feel when you became Poet Laureate um, of Jamaica? Was that something that shifted something in you or was it, I don't know, how, how did it make you feel? How did you receive Okay, I, I, I'm going to go back to my mother again who always said to me, <laughs> just, she said, what it comes, is, it was in your way, just receive it graciously and keep going. And that's how I live my life. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I was asked to become poet laureate and I thought, okay, I, this, give, this gives me a chance to serve my country and my people. And I have tried with my all my, that's what I've tried to do. Mm -hmm. And I viewed it as an opportunity to serve. And I, I, that's how I took it, you know. Could you describe it a little bit, what it's like to be Poet Laureate of Jamaica? Some people may not know. <laughs> most of us have never been Poet Laureate, so we know of it, but we don't know what it's like. Um, Could you elaborate a little? Well, you're kind of a national praise singer. That's how I see it, you know. Okay. <laughs> you're responsible for just, you know, working up interest in, in, in poetry, mm -hmm. um, getting people excited about poetry, sort of saying, um, you know, thinking about poems. One of the things I did was I, every independence, which is around August 6th, is celebrated in Jamaica, mm -hmm. I would write a poem, an independence-themed poem. Right. And the first two poems I did had to do with, one was, it was called, it was about, it was written from the point of view of an ens enslaved person who is just waiting to be, is, waiting to receive emancipation, around the time of emancipation. And I wrote this because I found out one is terrible, and it really is a heart-wrenching heart thing to even think about, to contemplate, that um, emancipation was not granted all at once. There wasn't sort of a proclamation that said, okay, now everybody can go. It was staggered, so one set of people were released first, and, then, and so they were released in stages. And the very last set of people to release were the field, like the, the, the sort of the, the field workers. And so you would, can you imagine just sitting there, being in that situation and watching people get let go and you know, and they keep saying, no, it's not your turn, no, it's not your turn. But my particular burden for that subject has to do with the fact that I was born by some amazing piece of serendipity or fate. On the 1st of August, which is the anniversary of emancipation, that is when slavery was officially abolished in Jamaica, on August 1st. So I think if it's my birthday, I have a burden on my heart for, for that particular subject. So I write a lot about enslaved people and, and I try to think, how you, th oh, you know, just empathy, to have what John Keats calls a negative capability, the ability to just enter into somebody's mind and think how they were feeling, you know. And so that those poems had to, it was, you know, had to do with two women w in the field watching people go past them and knowing that they've not, it's not their turn yet. That must have been. Yeah, the heart wrenching. Terrible, unimaginable. Yeah. 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 How are poems or how is writing in general that deals directly with slavery and emancipation received in Jamaica? Is it something people talk about or do you oh, do Well, I, absolutely, yes. And um, our, our singers, our reggae singers are known throughout the world. They're, they're, we sing about slavery, we do. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are very many cultures where people do that. Yeah. Jamaicans have always done that. And Jamaicans have this, this these ties to Africa, which just don't seem to, to be, you know, they can be severed. There are these pockets of retention in Jamaica still where they're just, you know, they're just tied to, 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 to Africa. And um, for example, during the, you know, the, the, in South Africa, during the time, the anti-apartheid struggles, you know, Jamaicans were uh, as concerned with apartheid. I mean, you would think, we, we, we never made any distinction between our free or how we felt and how they were feeling. I mean, and all the so there were lots of songs, you know, reggae songs made, a lot of poetry. We had endless, you know, poetry, poetry sessions where people would read anti-apartheid poems. People and something very mild, and, and South Africans know this. The first time I went to, to Johannesburg. I got into the airport, it was, it was not too long after apartheid ended, and I got to the airport and I went up to the cost to the immigration and I gave him my Jamaican passport and the guy said, just wait a minute, and he got up from behind where he was sitting and came out onto the, and he, he just shook my hand and he said, thank you. Because, you know, we just, there's just something about our connection to Africa, which is very real to many Jamaicans. When it's manifested in Marcus Garvey as well. Yeah, well, yeah, obviously, yeah, <laughs> but but that it, it it continues that you know. Yeah. Why do you think that is? 
that Jamaicans continue to talk about, sing about, write about. So that's just how we are. That's just, yeah. <laughs> we're just like that. Because other nations don't. We don't do it, they yes. don't do it. Yeah. Both in the Caribbean, in Africa, and no. especially and in so Europe, and obviously. No, and, like and, it's, and, and Africa, in, you know, in, right. I don't know, that's just, I just remember we've always felt like that. I mean, I remember seeing as a child people free, Patri you know, Patrice Lumumba, support for Patrice. Really? Just some, you know, you go by a fence and somebody's saying, you know, hooray for Patrice. It just, that's just how we are. Also, was I also in the newspapers in Jamaica and stuff like that? The free Patrice Lumumba, for example? No, the newspapers <laughs> would not have been saying that, you know, right. because our newspapers are very conservative. Okay. So this, that even made it even more interesting because mm -hmm. no matter what the official um, word was, <laughs> we on the street had our own version of it and we were for Patrice Le <laughs> yeah. mm. So apart from being a writer, you also teach? Yes, right? not anymore, I retired. Oh, okay. congratulations on the retirement then. Yeah. Um, if you had to give advice to aspiring writers or early career writers, what would it be? I began to write because I had to. I had no idea that what eventually happened after a long time would have happened. In that my work would become recognized. I, would get, I never thought I'd ever publish a book. I never thought I'd ever win a prize. I, you know, anything like that. I wrote because I had to write. There were stories that needed telling. There were things that I'd seen and heard and there was no other way for me to process them but to, or to write them, to shape them, mm -hmm. to give shape to them. And um, it's a good thing to know why you're doing what you're doing. If you're doing what you're doing because you're really hoping to win, every, win prizes and get money and be on TV and so on, it's probably not a good idea. It's a good idea to just know that you're following a noble tradition. It's, it's, it's a great thing to be doing. Writers and writing have contributed enormously to the, you know, to, 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 to the way the world, you know, to humanity. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else that reflects your humanity in quite that way. So it's something noble. It's a noble calling. And if you see it like that, then the other things will follow. But um, just make, you know, just make sure that you're not just writing to be writing because you might succumb to the temptation of sensationalizing your people, which I've seen happen, or just writing because, you know, this is what the market, you know, the, the marketplace wants this, and I've seen a particular kind of book mm -hmm. that does well, so maybe I should write something like that, and I'll, you know, you know what I'm saying? Definitely. So find your purpose. I don't even, just, just make sure, ask, if you found, okay, it's just the litmus, the list, litmus test is, if you're writing because you can't do anything, that's because that's you have to do it. Mm. Make sure you have to do it. Right. I have no choice. Yeah. I had absolutely no choice. I'm just thinking about your mm. work as you speak and it makes all so much sense. It feels mm. like, yeah, it has to come out and you can feel it as the reader. Mm. Yes. Mm. So what's next for you? Do you have any <laughs> immediate do you want to bring out some, are you writing something new? That, oh, you know? let, me, let me answer that first part first. I never know, I mean, I, I'm so, no plan I ever made in my life ever came to anything. All right. So I stopped making <laughs> plans. I think I'll start doing that as well. I never, no, honestly, no plan I ever made ever came to anything. Uh, and then I, one day I kind of realized that there seemed to be another plan there that I didn't know about. And all I had to do is kind of show up and do my work and mm -hmm. it would, you know, it would be made manifest. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm not as completely cl mindless as that, but I, I honestly don't know. Right. That's fine. I had no idea the, that I'd be sitting here talking to you mm -hmm. and meeting you and your nice husband this morning. <laughs> and, um, or that I'd go to Buckingham Palace and get the Queen's gold medal. Okay. I had no idea and I, yeah, so. I don't know how much you can t tell us about this, but how was that when you got the medal? What was it like? It, w it, was, it was very, you know, I thought of my people. That's what I did, you know, because that's what I'm doing. I'm putting my people 
dig through these poems and these stories and so on, people, I'm putting my people into the world now. Because I always felt, and here's, I'm very serious, that my Jamaican people were as deserving of attention and stories, what the stories and praise songs and odes and should be written to them just like to any other people. And that's what I set out to do. And if I got, rec and, and I think that is what was recognized. And so I felt, I felt that my people were, were, I'd gone there with my people. That's what I felt like. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh -huh. I felt all my, my people, my generations, as they say in Jamaica with me. My parents were with me, my, my, my African grandmother, great grandmothers were with me. They were there. Because that's what brought me there.